Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. Today we're studying Genesis chapter 14. Yesterday we studied Genesis 12 and we saw that God had called Abraham to establish a new nation that was unlike the nations of the world. Today we're going to study Genesis 14 and see that this new nation has a specific orientation to a specific God with a specific form of worship. So welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. My name is Russ Brewer. I'm pastor of Wellington Community Church in Wellington, Colorado. And today we're studying Genesis chapter 14 and the nation of worship that God is establishing through Abraham. And so as we turn to Genesis 14, let's start with some of the events of this chapter here. The year is something like 2084 BC. There are three main people in this passage. There's Abraham, there's his nephew named Lot, and there's a priestly king named Melchizedek. Now, we skipped Genesis 13, but back in Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot had a discussion. You might call this intense fellowship. And so they had this discussion about who was going to live where. And Abraham's nephew, Lot, chose to live in the Jordan Valley, and he went and lived in the city of Sodom. And at some point after Lot arrived in Sodom, Sodom began to experience some trouble. And so Sodom, along with four other cities in that region, began to pay tribute to a king named Keterleomer. Now, a tribute was kind of like a forced tax or a fine. It wasn't a good thing. And so the cities of this region were paying this tribute to Keto Laomer for about 12 years. But then verse 4 tells us that in the 13th year, five cities of this valley of Sidim rebelled against Keto Laomer and refused to pay him as tribute any longer. Evidently, they didn't think through their plan very well because soon Keto Laomer was coming down upon them with his army and three other kings to conquer them. And so this battle is going to be five against four. Ketelaomer and his four armies against these five cities. And so they come down and they defeat these cities. Ketelaomer's armies defeat these cities and they carry off everything, including the goods, the supplies, the women, the children, everything. Lot and his family were also taken captive. And so that's the scene. Lot and his family are caught up in this local skirmish and they've been taken captive. Now, going down to verse 13, Abram is living near the Oaks of Mamre, which is about 20 miles south of Jerusalem near Hebron. And at this point, Abram himself is a powerful man. And he hears that Lot's been kidnapped and he gathers 318 of his trained men, it says, and they head north to rescue Lot. And so they follow Ketelaomer's forces northward to a place called Dan. And Dan was far to the north, beyond modern-day Israel, up towards Assyria. In fact, verse 15 even mentions the city of Damascus, and Damascus is still around. It's up in modern-day Syria. And so in verse 15, Abram takes his small band of fighters, divides them into even smaller groups, and they attack Ketelaomer's army at night. Now, this night attack surprises Ketelaomer's army, and, and Abram and his 318 men defeat this army, and Ketelaomer's army flees to the north further, and Abram's men pursue them all the way up to the city of Hobath. And so this is an amazing victory that's clearly divinely orchestrated. And so then, after this, Abram gathers up Lot and the people and the spoils of the battle, and he brings them back home. And after he returns, two kings from his home region come out to celebrate with him. You got the king of Sodom in verse 17 and the king of Salem in verse 18. Now let's talk about these guys, these kings. The king of Sodom was just the guy who led the city of Sodom. In Genesis 19, God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness. So the king of Sodom was probably not a man known for his moral probity. So let's talk about this other king. Verse 18 tells us about the king of Salem, whose name is Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is the reason why we're studying this passage. Melchizedek's name is a combination of two Hebrew words. Melech means king, Sadek means righteousness. And so Melchizedek is a righteous king who stood out as someone who was uniquely righteous in this wicked region. He is also the first priest mentioned in the Bible. Verse 18 says he was a priest of the Most High God, and that signifies that Melchizedek didn't follow the pagan gods of the surrounding nations, but he followed the Most High God, the one true God, the Lord. And and verses 19 to 20 tell us that Melchizedek gave Abram a blessing, saying, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so Melchizedek's got good theology here, and he ties Abram's victory to its proper source to the Lord. And then we come to verse 20, where Abram then gives Melchizedek a tithe of the spoils. Now, this right here is the first mention of the word tithe in the Old Testament. The term tithe is a specific term used when someone gives an offering to someone else, usually to a king or to the Lord himself, and it's usually out of gratitude and obedience. And the term tithe is specifically used when a person gives 10% of something. 
If they gave less than 10%, it's not a tithe. If they give more, it's technically not a tithe either. The term tithe means 10%. And so in verse 20, Abram gives 10% to Melchizedek. And then in verse 21, the king of Sodom, and, and just pointing out here, this is not Melchizedek speaking, the king of Sodom says to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. And the king of Sodom's point is this, Abram, you've rescued my people. I'll take them back, but you can have all the stuff you've captured. But then look at Abram's response in verse 22. Abram does not want anything from the spoils of this battle. Verse 23 says he will take nothing, not even a thread or a sandal strap from these spoils. Now, why not? Well, the answer to that is key. In verse 23, he says he doesn't want any of this to make him rich. And why would that be such a big deal? Well, we talked about this yesterday. Abram was on a mission from God to establish a new nation of people who follow God. He doesn't need anything from this world to establish this holy nation. He only needs what God will give him for this new nation. And so he is fully entrusting himself and his people to the Lord. God will give them everything they need, and therefore God will get all the glory. And so here's this critical piece of this puzzle here. We're now seeing that this new nation will not be comprised of things of this world, and it will be also joined with a priesthood that specifically worships the Lord as opposed to the pagan gods of their region. Now, that's the account of Abram and Melchizedek, but here's the thing. Melchizedek is super important, and like so much of what we've been talking about in our studies in the book of Genesis, the account of Melchizedek does leave questions unanswered, but it lays the foundation that we're going to be seeing built on throughout the rest of the Bible. For instance, Melchizedek's name, as we mentioned before, means king of righteousness. This indicates that he was holy and upright in his life, so here we have the first priest mentioned in the Bible being noted for his righteousness. And this then helps us to establish the standard of priests who are to be holy and upright. This also means that he was unstained and unspotted by the world around him. He lived in a land that was known for its corrupt and perverse lifestyles. And there were many evil things that the people in the land of Canaan did, but Melchizedek wasn't a part of any of that. Likewise, in verse 18, we see that he was the king of Salem. Now, the word Salem is related to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. And so Melchizedek is also the king of peace, which points us to Jesus, who is called the Prince of Peace. We're going to come back to Jesus in just a moment. Melchizedek is serving in a region called Salem, which will later be named Jerusalem or Jerusalem. And that too is key because that is central to the region of God's people. And finally, and most importantly, not only do we know that Melchizedek was a priest, we also know that this is the priestly line that Jesus was a part of. Psalm 110 verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, speaking of Jesus the Son prophetically, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so Jesus is a priest in the line of Melchizedek. But at this point, we're now getting a bit ahead of ourselves because we need to pause and go deeper into what is a priest. The priesthood was one giant object lesson intended to teach a very important truth, that we are separated from God by our sin and we need a mediator to fix that. Now, this teaching is not popular in our world today, but it is true. It was true back then, it's true today. Going back to the Garden of Eden and in the fall, Adam and Eve were immediately separated from God. And yet we'll remember from that passage that they were not separated from Satan. They could not be in fellowship with a holy God but they had no problem being in fellowship, so to speak, with an unholy demon. And so Satan and his demonic realm have no problem giving us the sense of spirituality to deceive us into thinking we have fellowship with God when we don't. And so God has established this priesthood to show the people that there is a separation between us and him. Now, pagans have always rejected this idea. A person could go to the temple of Zeus anytime they wanted. The pagans were the ones who said that their gods were available to anyone and everyone. It was the Jews who said, God is too holy for you to come before him. And so the message of the priesthood represents the reality that God is too holy to have any fellowship with our sin. And in order for us to approach God, we need a mediator. Now, along these lines, another purpose of the priesthood is to show that we can't go to God on our own terms. When we submit to this concept of priesthood, we are submitting to God to let him be the one who determines when and how we meet with him. And in terms of how, the priesthood also shows us that our relation with God is based on, in a sense, activity. When we get to the book of Leviticus, we're going to see all the different ways that the Jews could worship and serve God. It's inherently an action book. It's filled with practical things that people were to do in order to worship God and have a relationship with him. And so the priesthood was an active reminder 
that there is a difference between being in covenant with God versus being in a living and active relationship with Him. Anybody could be born into the people of Israel and be circumcised on the eighth day and go about their lives never doing anything in fellowship with God. But the priests and their role in the festivals and in the temple worship and in their service to God taught the people that not only were they to be in covenant with God, they were to be in a personal, active relationship with Him as well. And this relationship was not merely about existence. It was about worship and service and obedience. And so the priesthood accomplished all of this. And for 2,000 years, from the days of Melchizedek to the days of Jesus, the Jewish priesthood stood as a testimony to these truths, that they were a nation of God's people who had access to God because they had priests who were appointed by God to bring them to him. And that now brings us to Jesus. Hebrews 2.17 and Hebrews 4.14 both say that Jesus is our high priest. Now, what does that mean? The high priest in the Old Testament was the man who made that one sacrifice, that Day of Atonement, every year on the Yom Kippur, that most holy sacrifice. And Jesus is the one who makes the one pure holy sacrifice that that atones for us all. And this reminds us that the Old Testament priesthood was really just a shadow of the New Testament priesthood of Jesus. Even the Old Testament seems to recognize this. Psalm 110 is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. And we read from Psalm 110 a few moments ago, and, and the book of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110 verse 4 saying, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And so Jesus was a priest in this Melchizedekian line. And like the Old Testament priests, Jesus' priesthood encompasses his life, his obedience, and, and he offers himself as the representative of his people. He was chosen by God for this purpose. He was appointed by the Father and commissioned for this work. He faithfully carried out his duties and he lived a life of purity and obedience. And his own death was an offering, his offering for our atonement, where his blood and his innocent life covers over our sins. He went before the Lord on our behalf. He represents us to God. And when God sees us, he does not see our lives or our obedience or our offerings, but the Lord's on our behalf. And so since Jesus is our high priest and because his offering was acceptable to the Father, he can draw us near to God as our representative. So that's Genesis 14. Yesterday, we saw that God had called Abraham to establish a new nation. Today, we see that this new nation will have a holy priesthood. For a while, it would be a priesthood in the line of Aaron. But ultimately, it's going to be an eternal priesthood in the line of Melchizedek through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we wrap up Genesis 14, sometimes Christians accidentally proclaim a message that sidesteps the priesthood of Jesus. And there are some Christians who, deep down, don't think there's a need to actually approach God through Jesus as their high priest. And there may even be Christians who don't actually have a living relationship with the God of the Bible because they haven't actually come to Him through the priesthood of Jesus. Maybe they're thinking that it's their church attendance or their Bible reading or something else that gives them access to God. None of that does. We only have access to God because we've been made righteous through the cross of Christ who is our high priest. And so when we approach God in our times of personal worship or even when we gather as a church family, it needs to always be present in our mind and often even in our words that we are approaching God because Jesus has made an offering of himself that has made us acceptable to God. Jesus offered himself, he is the Lamb of God, and he is the only offering that cleanses our sins before a holy God. And so we come to the Lord cleansed by Christ so that we might have fellowship with him because we have this high priest who mediates for us now and forever. We'll end things there. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day. And until tomorrow, God bless.